I just made you a co-host, Joe. Can you, uh, let's see, I'm going to, let me, down in the lower left-hand corner, there should be a link there for you to start your video and unmute yourself. Uh, that's the, um, okay. I hope we're not having the same problem we had last night. <laughs> there we go. I just unmuted you and you should be able to share your screen. Good morning. How are you? We can't hear you at the moment. So we can see your slides, but we can't hear you yet. No, that's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> let me see. Let me go up here and see if I can figure this out. Are you speaking there, Joe? Can you say something? I'm here, George. Can you hear me now? Oh, you know what? How about now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you on this one computer, but nobody else in the room can hear you. Could say so, something else. Can you and I then, George? <laughs> You guys can't hear that over the That's good. We'll plug in. <laughs> okay. Okay, how are we going? Can you hear me now, George? How are we going with sound? That's a thumbs up. Yes, you can hear me. Okay, I will. Um... Excellent. Okay, let's try and uh, share the slides again now, shall we? All right, so we're good to go, I'm assuming, George. And we'll start from the beginning. Okay, well, hello there. It's lovely to be here, even if it is remotely. I nearly spoke at a meeting of yours uh, back in 2016 when I was on my Koha World Tour. I was between jobs and having binge watched six seasons of The Good Wife, I tweeted that I was pondering a Koha World Tour. Within 24 hours, I had received enough support to make it worth investigating. And within four days of posting on the Koha list, I had enough offers of hospitality to commit to the trip. Within a fortnight, I was frantically trying to trim it down to only three months, and that's when I had to make ruthless cuts. Utah, Texas, and South America. So I guess calling it a world tour is a bit of a stretch in hindsight. 
I'm filling the slot usually devoted to the history of Koha. The code for library, uh, code for lib paper I wrote back in 2009 is still the best history of the development. So let's move on to some pretty pictures. I'm a librarian from Levin, the ex-CEO of Tahora Whenua Trust, where I established and operated a new library, culture and community centre that opened in September 2012. I was one of a team who developed Koha back in 1999, essentially a couple of librarians, a programmer, a web designer and a network engineer. So my between jobs status came about because council had decided to close down the trust and take delivery, library services delivery back in house. Within a week of the decision being made, I was gone. I'd never been let go before, I'd never been unemployed. I loved working in libraries and with Koha and had lost it all. I was in shock and my self esteem obliterated. I was also lonely and bored. Well, Twitter is my place. So I tweeted and my Koha peeps came to the rescue. Here you can see my round the world journey. I was able to visit so many places thanks to incredible hospitality offered by librarians, vendors, developers and benevolent onlookers from right around the globe. And you know, I could have doubled the trip, the length of the trip by going to Africa and South America as well. My first stop was Sydney for a few days with Bob and Irma, the mom and pop of Koha. We optimistically hosted a Sydney user group meeting, but sadly only one librarian turned up, so we went off to a great start. Irma, Bob and I discussed how many truly lovely people there are in the Koha community. No need to name names, but there are many genuinely kind, friendly and giving people in Koha. One of the conversations I had with some librarians in Malaysia was how brave I must be to travel abroad alone. Well, you know, it's really easy to be brave when everyone is so kind. I felt blessed and so grateful that I had the opportunity to meet people who love Koha as much as I do. The Islamic University of Science, the Penang Public Library and Ishmael from Open Systems were my hosts in Malaysia. I arrived in the middle of the night to be told he'd be picking me up at 7 a.m and I'll be speaking for three hours to about 200 people. Just lucky I had a few presentations prepared and I was able to string them together. I had asked Ishmael to let me know what I needed to do to, offend, to avoid offending my hosts. And he was quite put out. Muslims are the most hospitable people on the world, on earth, I was told. And later I was told to make sure I was well covered and to not shake the hands of men. So guess who rocked up to the university receiving line of men at the university with my hand outstretched. I was horrified, I pulled back my hand, but the chancellor smiled and shook my hand. This was later a great topic for discussion among the ladies at lunch and justified because Sue had been overseas in new Western ways. One project at the Penang Public Library which blew my socks off in its simplicity had such potential to be life-changing. A blind staff member translates books into Braille and prints out sticky, clear, sticky tape of the Braille text, which is then stuck into new children's picture books. This enables a blind person to read along with their fingers while being read to and thus hearing the sound of the words. It was so simple. India. Man, I love this place. It is so full on and so vibrant and energetic and busy and colourful and smells gorgeous and smells terrible and the people are great. So, you know, it was a fabulous third stop on my world tour. My Indian hosts from First Ray Consulting and LibServe really pushed out all the stops, including meeting me in the middle of the night. Plus a long wait while I sorted out where in the world my luggage might be, because it certainly wasn't in Mumbai with me. First up was a guest speaker slot at a user group meeting in the Nehru Centre, Mumbai, with the gorgeous Arati Desai, who was as elegant and graceful as I was not in my tra trainers and beach garb. She kindly offered to get the Chief of Police involved with finding my luggage, which was uh, not required. 
I spoke to the library science master's students and staff at Pune, Pune University and the Tata Institute of Social Sciences about the key themes of public librarianship and also about career management. The Tata Institute runs Kolha, all four campuses throughout India as branches. The library students are taught about Kolha as part of their training, including how to download it, install it, configure it and run it. And this is because many of them will go back to rural areas and will probably be running Kolha. At Pune University, I met Shubhara Nagata, and as well as discussing library stuff, really good library stuff, she snuck me away for a tour of the library, which houses 5 million items classified using Ranganathan's colon, colon system and stretching back hundreds of years. I got to see an ancient manuscript written on the spine of palm leaves. At every session, I needed to remind people that there is no boss of Koha. There's no board, no staff, no one's in charge. Everyone has a voice and the ability to contribute. And if they want an interface or a user manual in Meraki, then they have to translate that themselves. If they need or want something in acquisitions changed, they need to load a bug. In short, scratch your own itch. That bottom left picture is their battery backup, which I just thought was extraordinary. We visited Pune Public Library, 171 years old and the oldest public library there. It is run by a board of trustees who are nothing short of inspirational. Mostly older in age, mostly retired professionals and all absolutely bursting with pride at their fab library in inner city Pune and that they were running Koha. I particularly love the paintings of freedom fighters lining the walls. How inspirational is that? Education and literacy are the keys to changing lives and libraries are thus hugely important. These professionals talked about, these, these trustees talked about the importance of libraries as space for people to come in and read, particularly students. If there was no space at home, that's why the libraries came in. Their collections were terrible. The library buildings themselves, so well used. These retired professionals had spent their careers earning money and their retirement giving it away, including sponsoring public libraries to get Koha. In London, I was sponsored for my London presentation by PTF Europe and Catalyst IT Europe, which was such a delight. This aspect of vendors working in co-opetition is one of the aspects of the Koha community which I really like. A few PTFS clients were attendants, which was really nice because it was the day after a public holiday. And a highlight for me was meeting these good folk in person. People I knew only as names on mailing lists and on IRC meetings are now meeting in the flesh. I was in London for three days, seriously underestimated the time I would need to do London. Next up was the Czech Republic, where I was hosted by Bodan Smyla. I was blessed to be staying in his ancestral summer home, a gorgeous old villa in the scenery, surrounded by an ancient orchard and a forest to the back doorstep. Bodan took me to meet Mike Denner and his colleagues at Cheska Trubova before heading on to a meetup at Ola Milk University, where I met Radek Saman a developer who agreed to let me sponsor him to the Hack Fest in Marseille. Viewfind is widely used as the OPEC referent interface in Czech Republic, which I found interesting and I don't really understand. I also attended a user group in the Agricultural Library in Prague, followed by a good discussion and beer. Have I talked about the Czechs and their beer yet? They drink it by the bucket full, even really nice looking ladies who you would expect to be drinking pims swing away on great handles of the stuff. It's delicious, don't get me wrong, but they sure are big servings. After a quiet few ales, large, and a meal, even larger, Bodan had a lovely surprise for me and I was taken out to visit a weekend library school for distance education librarians. It was in the countryside, like the real countryside, 
deers running across the road kind of countryside. The school was held in a semi-restored farmhouse first reported in the 1500s. There was a keg of beer, barbecue, and a fire. <clears throat> One thing that caught me unawares a bit was that Europe doesn't really have earthquakes. And that's why there are so many old buildings, like the oldest Romanesque church in the Czech Republic, in a town that had not much of anything to see, really. Um, and look at this Bella Pop, Bella Pop building on the right. Um, the Czech Republic's full of them. And those, those chicks, are, they'd fall off and kill someone in New Zealand. We just don't have buildings like that. In Marseille, Paul Polain had arranged me to stay in an under-restoration medieval nunnery. And I completely freaked out. It was ancient, unreinforced masonry with huge empty voids, and I, I simply could not stay there. I was terrified to even be in it. A recurring theme in every country I visited was the matter of sharks. Koha vendors who were overcharging and not contributing their developments back to the community. This meant that with every upgrade, those enhancements, which had not been incorporated back into the main trunk, broke. And thus the work had to be done again, and so the sharks could charge again. This was a real concern, and, and the, the concern was that it would give Koha a bad name, and I can understand that concern. In my presentation, I talked about the important role of the vendors in helping build a strong community. We all want many vendors in the globe, around the globe, running successful support services for Koha. That's a really good thing. But what we also want is for those vendors to be good Koha community members as well and contribute back to the project in the spirit of open source and in keeping with the name. It is up to librarians to insist that their vendors keep to the open source spirit and not play the old bait and switch game where libraries think they are buying into open source koha but end up with a proprietary setup. I flew to Vienna from Prague and spent two days incognito enjoying the city and walking myself stupid, trying to fit in too much. I visited the Schönbrunn Palace and Sissi Museum, and in the evening I had a quick drink with Martin Vermeijen, my host in Vienna, who was worried that he was neglecting his duties, but he certainly made up for it later. Martin escorted me to the Bristol Hotel for a fabulous dinner, before I headed up to a Mozart performance, in costume, in the most stupendously golden opera hall I had ever seen before books included. The next day was the Upper Bel Belvedere, and as I was walking the magnificent art collection, I was chatting on Facebook to my sister in New Zealand who had visited the year previously. There was something surreal when she asked if I'd seen Napoleon and his horse yet, just as I sat myself down to gaze at this wonderful painting, which I had studied at university in 1981. It was so instant and immediate, and we were discussing a piece of art from opposite sides of the world. Technology, eh? I might have been travelling alone, but I was absolutely not alone or lonely. In the middle of rural Vienna, I came face to face with someone I knew. Have we met? I asked. I don't think so. My name's Patrick, he replied. Danowski. I said. We had met before at the Bridging Worlds Conference in Singapore in 2008. I stayed at the guest quarters on campus. It was very much like a hotel room, except everything was ultra modern. It's a brand new university. I couldn't turn the lights on, couldn't work the shower, couldn't get the TV going, and couldn't dispense soap. <laughs> so it was really comfortable, but it did feel a bit like I was in a Star Trek movie. After a campus tour, I presented at the Vienna Users Group meeting and then we repaired to a wine bar where we drank new wine, which is very seasonal, like halfway between juice and wine, and then more wine, and then more wine, and then some schnapps. There was one exciting moment when I awoke in the middle of the forested countryside in very steep, hilly country, knowing with every fiber in my being, having traveled the route twice, that things were not right. Are we lost? I asked the taxi driver accusingly. 
vague head nods and hand gestures and then sorry. Best we turn on the GPS then, lad, was all I could offer before dozing off again. Anyway, with profuse apologies, I was eventually delivered back to my Star Trek cell and I collapsed into bed absolutely done in by the inner hospitality. <clears throat> the Kohai gathering in Berlin was terrific. About 20 people and a lovely evening meal afterwards and a few beers with these lovely gents who work with Murpo in a shared working space. Murpo is frantically busy doing koha coolness in Berlin, but made the time to squeeze in a terrific day sightseeing. We visited Charlottenburg, home of the Habsburgs, and home of the most astounding silver collection in the world. We were there first and entered the ballrooms devoid of any tourists, which was pretty special. We did get rained out briefly and had a cup of tea in a crazy Russian tea house, packed to the gunnels with stuff, and then did a four hour river cruise with beer, of course. Europe's a hard place to travel. It occurred to me at about this time that, that we were developing a whole bunch of different versions of koha, essentially forks, I guess, and I, I'm not sure it's the way to go. I think the whole world benefits if everyone shares their development effort. And that's, that's the essence of koha. What I was seeing with some vendors, developers and libraries carrying out development in isolation from the main trunk. And this meant we ended up with customized local versions, forks, which meant that for every upgrade forever, those customizations would have to be folded in. I think we have to be wary of the tyranny of small differences. You know, Kai is a global product and many thousands of librarians use it very happily every day right around the globe. Probably 90% of what we do is pretty standard. You know, are your customizations and quirks really necessary? Librarians are terrible at getting angst ridden about tiny peculiarities. And I wonder if sometimes if we should be asking ourselves, really? Do we have to be that unique or special? If we used a proprietary system, we would just adjust our processes to suit. And there is a risk, I think, in having a myriad of koha forks, which while they start off as minor variations, are at risk of evolving into effectively proprietary koha. Uh, if this happens, then we'll lose all the, you know, we'll all lose the benefits of shared development. I had planned a week to quietly potter around in Derry, Northern Ireland, to see if I could track down the family of my grandfather who left Derry in 1926. My mum had been searching for years, even hiring a researcher in Ireland, but all we had was granddad's birth certificate and a marriage license of his parents. On the first day, I found a candidate for what could possibly be my great grandmother in the city cemetery. The electronic records were inconclusive, so I sent an email to the records office in the gatehouse to see if I could view the actual register. Of course, come on over. I was there in 20 minutes flat. The records office's office flipped through a catalog card drawer and pulled out original register box and it was official. I found my great grandmother Elizabeth and her husband Patrick, my great grandfather. There was a wealth of information on those registers, those paper records. None of that was available in the electronic records. But I found the surnames McBride and Callahan. On a whim, I took a hire car over to Donegal and using my phone and Google Maps, I found my way down one-way mud tracks to Moneymore, where Patrick and his siblings had been raised. Just on dusk, and then the credit ran out on the phone and data roaming stopped working altogether because Donegal is another country to Derry. And I found myself <coughs> frantically reversing and having to carry out eight point turns. I finally found myself back on the highway. Seeing a road sign for Newton Cunningham, birthplace of great granddad, I swung into the only pub in sight and collapsed with a glass of wine, relieved but quite disappointed. The waitress asked who I was and what I was doing. Oh, she said, there are still loads of McBride's down Moneymore Way. It's a rural area with scattered houses and farms. 
and I'm a Callahan. I'll ring my mammy. Well, the luck of this happening was astounding, and I went back and spent the next day with her. I arranged for the restoration of the headstone in Derry before I left Ireland, adding my grandfather's name and that he died in New Zealand. Well, last Christmas, I was contacted on Facebook by second cousins who lived 10 minutes out of Derry, and they'd been up to see the headstone and track our family back to New Zealand. Digital tools, man, they transform everything. But I couldn't have found our family if I hadn't visited that gatehouse and searched through those catalogue cards. Mm. Norway. <clears throat> Norway and the lovely Magnus. First up in Norway was a visit to the Oslo Public Library, who were two weeks out from going live on Koha. They did some really cool stuff with the Koha API about the semantic web and recommendations. My understanding is it's basically a standard Koha install with all sorts of API magic. And of course, all their work is on GitHub, so the community can share whatever they like, which is awesome. I saw so many stunning libraries in Norway, including the new Boldo Library, which was this incredible light-filled glass structure facing the harbour. Oslo Public Library were doing great things, renovating their existing 1930s building. It's a big old solid thing, so really hard, hard to knock walls about. But it has great bones and features, including huge windows, and they were working wonders with colour. It convinced me again that all you need are clever librarians with great taste to transform a space into a perfectly acceptable public library. And this was confirmed when we visited the first purpose-built public library in Oslo, a World War I era building. And while the downstairs was unashamedly a step back in time, as in 100% authentic, the upstairs youth library area was stunning. I also spoke twice at a university in Oslo and visited a private university for art and design that had recently opened in a refurbished warehouse. We had a tour of all floors, and this building was not only truly beautiful, but had a range of great student spaces to suit the collaborative way of working and the flipped classroom trend. North of the Arctic Circle with Magnus. You know, I've never been so cold in my life, but Magnus took me on this incredible day, and it was only a night and a day, a day trip to Lofoten Islands. If you ever get the chance to go to Norway, do it. And I would rate Magnus 10 out of 10 as a tour guide. I'd definitely book him again. I attended a Swedish library group meeting hosted by Pierre Fawkes and Mabel Helen at Hogskollen University in Gavla. It had a beautiful library, so light-filled and elegant and with great spaces for students, including 30 Yes, 30 bookable rooms for small group work. The user group was very well attended, and there were a number of presentations about Koha, including Oslo Public Library showcasing their wonderful work, which had gone live that week. I was concerned, though, to hear one library speak about how hard it had been and how hard it was going it alone, having recently switched to Koha, and I felt they had no one to talk to or for help. They do not appear to have found the Koha community in the various help channels, IRC, online chat, discussion lists, tutorials, etc. I spent the weekend before Koha Hackfest with Sophie from Bib Libra and her family, about 40 minutes out of Marseille, near AM um, Aix in Provence. You would think living in hotels and eating restaurants every meal will be glamorous. And it is for a while, but there's nothing nicer than being embraced by a family and living normally. The best thing of all was that their home was full of beautiful contemporary art, and they loved gorgeous food as much as I do. Sophie and Eric were the perfect hosts and tour guides, and the first stop was a total surprise, Paul Cezanne's studio. We also went to an old Cistercian Abbey, completely austere, devoid of ornamentation and absolutely beautiful. The term, a religious sense of war, 
was how it felt walking around. I was constantly amazed at the engineering employed by the cathedral builders back in the day. But you know, this market was probably just a typical French market found everywhere, but oh, blew me away. It was simply wonderful, and I took so many photographs. Marseille. So the Europe League of the trip ended with a two day hack fest in, at Bib Libre in Marseille. 66 people. Honestly, it was like a scene from Love Actually. A bunch of us met up in the square with delighted hugs and handshakes. Some were meeting in person for the first time after years of talking online, like me and Owen. Others were old and new friends re reuniting. Me and Catherine, who hadn't met since Kohakon 2010. And me and Murka, who I'd only seen a few weeks earlier. Over the next three hours as people arrived, that scene was repeated. And again, the next morning at the Biblibra offices as people arrived. I spent my time developing a trust deed for a new trust that would take possession of the Koha assets that would be passed over with the winding up of Tohora Whenua Trust. And this is because with the trust winding up, assets would default to council. And Koha, apparently, could perhaps be monetized, like we were ever going to allow that to happen. So with haste, we created a new to Hora Whenua Trust 2016 organization and transferred the digital assets to it. And that new trust now sits benignly on the side doing absolutely nothing, just as the original Hora Whenua Library Trust had done absolutely nothing for years before. An infamous part of Hackfest is the cheese lunch and by crikey, it was astounding. We all ate too much and I can say for the first time in my life, I was cheesed out. America. I was hosted in Washington by Brooke Johnson. We had agreed early on that we weren't going to race around like idiots and try and see everything. That we were going to relax and enjoy gorgeous food and great restaurants. Brooke and I had travelled in India a few years earlier. We both enjoyed delicious food, so I knew I was in good hands. Washington is gorgeous. In addition to seeing all the awesome buildings and landmarks, we got to the Smithsonian and saw the dinosaurs and rocks and managed to connect also with uh, Phil Shapiro out at Tacoma Park. There was an amazing project in the hallway of the new community centre, a collection of portraits showcasing and celebrating the diversity of the Tacoma Park Library community. I really like that. After Washington and a train trip to New York, which I did in two days, not long enough, I caught a nine hour train trip to Essex Junction, where I was hosted by Vocal, consortia of 58 Koha libraries in Vermont. So you guys know America's really, really big. I couldn't believe it. Eight, nine hours in a train and you couldn't even see it on a map. I was met by Wendy Hisco and Lara Keenan from Vocal and we visited five libraries and I spoke at a consortium meeting. I was hosted in Montreal by Eric, Serge and the In Libro team. You know, I traveled to the other side of the world. I walk into an office and I found someone I knew, Francois, who I'd met at Koha Con in Mumbai in 2011. I love this about Koha. The global nature of the community means that you never know where people are going to turn up or which vendor they might be working for. I spent a couple of gentle days sightseeing after developing a list of must-sees with the In Libro folk following a user group establishment meeting was great by the way and one of the things I really wanted to do was see a hockey game in Canada and in Libro did me proud taking me to a fantastic game at the Bell Centre. It's so much more immediate than a rugby game because the rink is so much smaller and you're sitting right there. We even have ice on our face. Kansas. Where I was hosted by George from Nichols and Jason from Sickles. And look at this photograph. It's astounding to a Kiwi. It's just flat. 
and big sky and goes on forever. George joined a very, a very select group of Koha alumni who made middle of the night pickups for me after a six hour delay in Chicago. We covered a lot of ground in Kansas. We saw a lot of libraries. And I have realized after visiting Vermont and Kansas that much of Heartland America seems to be populated by many small public libraries with the occasional big one, like Lawrence, which was a stunning refurbishment with a new building basically wrapped around a huge, brutalist 1970s bunker. The funding models are very different to New Zealand. And I gather that philanthropy has a major role to play and that the general wealth of an area as well. It appeared that communities that need libraries the most and whose citizens have the most to gain tended to be more poorly funded. I don't know, it kind of sucks a bit really. Portland and Bywater Solutions sponsored most of the American League of my Koha World Tour. Brendan took me home and allowed me to be part of his family with Sonia, Ginny and Alou. I mean, I've loved traveling and the hotels and the restaurants, but sometimes it was just so nice to be part of a family, eat simple food like the delicious scrambled eggs I had with Christine in Vermont, and to sleep with a dog at the end of my bed. I got to meet Lenora Offerdahl from a fisheries research library in Portland. Now they were the first or second library in the States to go into Koha. Pretty cool. Also I went to a user group meeting about three hours away from Portland, ending with a great visit to a craft brewery. Being in Portland was the perfect way to start winding up my Koha World Tour. The trip had been bookended with Bob and Irma Birchall sending me off on my way at Sydney and Brendan pretty much wrapping it up for me in Oregon. Been away about three months at this point. And that's the Pacific Ocean. And I think it was about now that I started getting homesick. I love meeting people in this wonderful Koha community. I was moving to a new place every three days and, and I wanted to meet everyone and talk to everyone and drink beer with everyone and accept every offer of hospitality and see and experience everything in every city. But this takes energy, energy I was just starting to run out of. Although I guess I could, I figured I could just sleep for a week when I got home. <clears throat> My last library visits were with these two lovely ladies at the Maritime Museum and American Bookbinders Museum in San Francisco. One thing I did at most libraries I visited was ask them to show me their favorite collection items. And I saw some lovely stuff, including this gorgeous illustrated seafarer's book in the middle. Now here's a lesson for you folks. I didn't write a blog post in San Francisco. The rest of this presentation drew really heavily on posts I had wrote at Britain as I traveled around, but not this one. So that's all I can say about San Francisco. I was hosted by the younger brother of one of our friends at the library. She said, just ring him up. So I did. It turns out he was incredibly well connected and I got private tours at the concert opera hall and an art gallery that he was a docent of at and a walking tour of Russian Hill. Koha is a Maori word, meaning a gift or a donation, or perhaps more like giving your speciality to a collective event. There is a sense of quid pro quo or reciprocation about the concept too. The Koha community and this world trip replenished me, restored my confidence, We gave our software to the world of librarianship. It was our koha. And through this world tour, where I was hosted so generously, koha friends gave me back my, my love of librarianship. Thank you.
So uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you, yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for talking to us and I'm wondering if anybody here has any questions. We were still muted, but everybody was clapping when you finished, so. <laughs> Did you hear it? Yeah. Right. I'm wondering if anybody here has any questions and maybe I'll start, uh, you know, uh, what is it that you found, you know, from being there at the beginning of Koha and then going around the world 16 years later, what was the thing that you found that you, you weren't, that you were truly surprised by that you didn't expect when you started this project in, in late 1999? What was something that really struck you as just something completely unexpected? How proud people were to be running Koha. Um, start, I mean, right from Malaysia, you know, people were just so proud to be part of some, part of this. The fact that it was a collective, that it, that it was a community, um, that, that just kept hitting me all over the place. You know, people were just so proud of it. I hadn't expected that. Well, I think everybody here is a testament to what you just said. You know, we're all, you know, some of us came from a long ways away to get to the middle of the United States to, to, you know, not just to hear you talk, but you know, that was, I'm sure the highlight for most people. Um, so I think everybody here is, you know, in agreement with that, you know, we're all very proud of Koha, so we're happy to be here. Um, anybody else have any questions, which you'll have to come up here probably to ask him if you want to talk to Joe, so. And remember we started something tiny like that version 1.0 was, was nothing like what we've got now. You know, we, we kind of planted a seed. It's the community that's made it what it is today. It certainly wasn't hard for Noah Library Trust. So no questions? I think you blew them all away. They're all stunned to silence, Joe. <laughs> or asleep. It's that post-lunch session. <laughs> we did just have lunch, so there are probably a few people that are full. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you for doing this with us, and uh, thanks for being here. We're all very, very happy to see you. So, thanks. Well, a lot. it was lovely to catch up again, George. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You're welcome. Okay. Bye. 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 Thanks. See you.